Yeah. Um, okay, thank you for inviting me. I'm glad to deliver this lecture. Uh, and originally, it was presented in a workshop by the Clay Mineral Society that uh, this was the title, Health, Protecting, Health Protection Using Clay Minerals, uh, a relationship between clays and health in general. And um, the, uh, as a matter of fact, what uh, uh, I'm going to show in the next uh, 40 minutes or 35 minutes, something like that, is a collection of several projects that were performed during the last years uh, related to um, um, removal or uh, degradation of um, BPA and BPS. Uh, because uh, um, as a matter of fact, we are working with the students, uh, most of them uh, BSc or MSc students, and uh, they are uh, presenting in some cases very nice works, but uh, one of the problems that you will see is that uh, for example, um, not all the experiments were performed in at the same conditions. Uh, so you should consider it like a kind of collection of uh, tools uh, where clay was used for the removal of uh, uh, endocrine disrupting components like ED, uh, BPA and BPC. Uh, and I uh, will focus mostly on two uh, options that uh, where clay can be very helpful, and those are uh, absorption and uh, photodegradation. Um, I, I must mention a priori that you and you will see it also in the results that each of the um, possible treatments uh, uh, is very specific. That means it can work with one pollutant and fail completely on the other one. And, uh, and I think that this uh, uh, should be mentioned in any, in, in, in any treatment. Uh, the, the, the feeling that you can uh, prepare something that will be wonderful for all pollutants, I think that uh, at least from my point of view, in, in my experience, uh, it's something that uh, it does not happen. Uh, so let's start. Uh, we know that the uh, fresh water uh, resources are limited, and we know that uh, uh, anthropogenic pollutants are uh, getting inside the water, and then we get them after that in, in some cases in our tap water because um, um, there are several uh, contaminants that are not fully removed uh, by uh, usual uh, water treatment processes. Uh, such pollutants are, have a lot of names in the last years. They, uh, in the past, they were priority pollutants. In the last years, uh, they are usually uh, defined as emerging contaminants. Uh, and they include a lot of components and a lot of chemicals, part of them pharmaceuticals. Other ones are coming from the industry uh, and may have influence on our health. Uh, and uh, for example, the, um, those two molecules that are coming from the plastic industry mostly uh, are in some cases uh, um, mimic, uh, do in some cases mimic uh, uh, activities of uh, um, hormones. And uh, since that, uh, due to that, the, those are considered as, as endocrine disruptive compounds. Um, the, the, most of the experiments where the a, a effect was shown were indeed made with a, a zebra fish or, 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 or with other kind of a very small a, a, a animals. A, but then again, a, it is a, apparently it's obvious that uh, uh, the, our body can confound, uh, can, can by mistake take those uh, um, component, uh, components as uh, uh, estrogen and uh, cause, and by that we will get uh, endocrine disruption. And uh, due to the increased awareness to that, uh, we know that in several cases, in, especially in bottles, or, or um, um, you can see the term BPA-free that is widely used, and that is to inform us that the plastic does not include this component BPA. 
but instead of VPA, they are introducing analogs. There are several analogs, and um, most analogs, so I think all analogs, have more or less the same problems as VPA, uh, even though in some cases um, the problems are uh, uh, somehow alleviated in concentrations uh, 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 that are needed in order to get damage uh, higher. Uh, so the problem is that uh, BPA and BPS, as other uh, 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 bisphenol analogs, have been found in water sources uh, since uh, water treatment plants are only uh, partially effective in uh, take them, taking them out from the water. And, um, and, and you can find several papers where they mentioned that the removal of those components from the water uh, requires uh, urgent uh, attention. And that is even though uh, those uh, species are not considered persistent because uh, uh, the treatments degrade them, but not enough in order to avoid them to get back uh, to the water in Israel, especially uh, uh, in the irrigation, but in other countries, uh, they are going back to the river and then the next uh, settlement, the next village uh, down the river uh, is using them uh, uh, back uh, as tap water. Um, and how are those uh, EDCs usually removed? Uh, there are, of course, biological degradation processes, for example, what's going on in wastewater treatment plants, uh, but there are also other approaches, like, for example, absorption or uh, advanced oxidation processes, what's called AOP. Uh, clays can be used, can be helpful in all three, uh, uh, and let's say, pathways. Uh, for example, you can combine enzymes uh, to uh, clay-based materials in order to uh, make them more stable or more effective, uh, or you can prepare specifically engineered solvents uh, in order to remove uh, such kind of pollutants, uh, or you can prepare specifically uh, 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 engineered uh, catalysts uh, in order to achieve uh, uh, efficient uh, advanced oxidation processes uh, of those molecules. Uh, and I will focus in the next minutes on the last two, on absorption and photodegradation. And let's start with absorption. Um, if you look at the literature, you will see that several absorption media were tested for BPA, BPS, BPF, and all other bisphenols, uh, but only on some of them and only in, in a few cases, uh, they, they really performed more than batch experiments. Uh, that means that uh, when you want to see if uh, the absorbent is efficient or not, you need in the end to try to test it in uh, at least in column uh, experiments. And that was not always made. Uh, and it's quite difficult to estimate how efficient will be a sorbent only from batch experiments. Uh, we are working on absorption matrices in our group uh, for several years uh, uh, based on clays, organoclays, clays combined with polymers, uh, et cetera. And there are, I think, hundreds, hundreds of groups uh, uh, around the world that are working in similar uh, topics. Uh, this started more or less in the middle of the 20th century. And in the case of uh, BPA and bisphenol in general, um, usually we're talking about uh, absorption processes uh, or absorption solvents that are based on organoclase. Uh, that's for BPA. For BPS, I, we could find only one study that used a clay-based material um, um, in 2020. Uh, but then again, uh, for BPA, there are several organoclase, pillar clays, Etc. that were tested, most of them based on quaternary ammonium cations. Um, there were some experiments or some uh, studies uh, that exploited pi-pi uh, interaction, interactions, interactions, aromatic interactions uh, between rings. Uh, um, and that's what we try to do because we have a very good experience with uh, an organoclay that it's based on Montmorillonite and uh, thiamine, vitamin uh, B1, 
uh, absorb monoclonite with uh, thiamine, it's uh, um, an organic monovalent cation uh, at regular conditions. So it binds to the clay uh, electrostatically, and we have a very nice paper published uh, in uh, 2018 uh, by uh, Shani Ben Moshe. She's now uh, uh, at, uh, I think it's, she's finishing her PhD uh, at the Technion. Um, and, uh, but then again, she, uh, as a matter of fact, she brought the idea of using thiamine uh, because at the beginning she studied in the food, uh, in the nutrition uh, department in Tel High College. Uh, and it works very nicely uh, for the removal of phenol. So we tested it with uh, BPA, BPS. Uh, at the beginning, we tried uh, to absorb BPA to clays in general. And what you see here is the absorption to halocyte. Uh, why we use halocyte or sepiolite? Because we know that halocyte and sepiolite can absorb not only cations, but also non-charged molecules. But in this case, the absorption is almost, uh, there is no absorption at all. Of course, that montmorillonite do not absorb because uh, uh, again, uh, usually it does not absorb uh, a non-charged, uh, uh, sorry, uh, no. No, it was correct. Non-charged molecules. So we start modifying the montmorillonite. We use montmorillonite with berberine that was very effective in some cases, and we got some absorption. Uh, but then again, when we tested montmorillonite with thiamine, then we get very nice absorption uh, up to uh, about 0 0.2 and even more uh, millimoles of BPA per gram of uh, uh, sorbent. Uh, when we tested what's going on with BPS on this sorbent, then we saw that also it is absorbed, but you can see here the differences in the pattern. I will uh, uh, say a few words after, what, after that by trying to mm, adapt models uh, to the absorption of BPA and BPS uh, to uh, Montmorillonite with B1. But then again, it looks very nice, but uh, uh, we should also mention that when we compare that with what's going on with phenol, uh, you see that uh, this is a BPA, uh, uh, this is BPS, the green one, uh, 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 but uh, phenol absorbs a lot more. Uh, and that's taking me back to the um, remark that I said at the beginning, you should consider that each pollutant and each solvent is different. And, uh, and the, the feeling that maybe we can do something that will be good uh, enough for everything. Um, I, I think that this will be uh, uh, impossible. Uh, let's try to adapt some absorption models to BPA and BPS absorption to um, um, our modified organoclay. And uh, those are the measured results. And uh, for BPA uh, in blue, for BPS in green. And when we started uh, trying testing a uh, Langmuir model, Langmuir equation, then we saw that a, a Langmuir equation does not fit so well uh, for BPA. Uh, on the other hand, if we combine Langmuir equation with a partition uh, a, a mechanism between the solution and the sorbent, then we get a lot of better results. We can see a very nice fit for BPA by combining both mechanisms. In the case of BPS, Langmuir results are indeed more or less enough. We get some improvement by using the dual mode model, Langmuir plus partition, but again, I assume that uh, most of us will be uh, pretty happy with the uh, fit that we can see uh, for the Langmuir model. Uh, by the way, I prefer not to use linearization approaches, uh, but directly to try to adapt the results to the equations. And this can be done very easily uh, at uh, those days, uh, even by MATLAB or by R, or even by Excel, by using the Solver algorithm in Excel. Uh, that's what we did in this case. Uh, we can see that for BPA, uh, the Langmuir model alone does not deliver a good fit. Uh, it's the R square, uh, but for BPS, we get already from the Langmuir model a quite nice fit. 
And this leads us to the a feeling that uh, BPA might work better in colon experiments because we have two mechanisms. We have the uh, very strong absorption at the first stage. And after that, we have a kind of partition mechanism. Uh, that means that when we went one step forward, we prepared uh, columns with uh, our organic clay mixed with sand. Uh, and the reason that usually organic clay is mixed with something is that uh, the hydraulic conductivity of organic clay is terrible. So if you want your water, your polluted water to flow through it, you need to add something that increases the hydraulic conductivity. Uh, in most cases, sand is used, and this sand is very a uh, nice uh, um, uh, additive if you want to test what your servant is doing. But uh, uh, now we are working a lot with uh, uh, organo clay combined with activated carbon because, uh, as a matter of fact, uh, we want to get the the benefits of both of them. Organo clay absorbs relatively very fast. Uh, activated carbon usually have a large capacity. Uh, so by combining both, we can get better columns. But in this case, we wanted to see what the organo clay knows uh, can do uh, uh, when absorbing the BPA. Uh, the experiment that you see, saw in the side in the in the film was uh, with a, a colorant. It's not BPA. BPA has no color. Absorbs at the UV. Uh, so we prepared uh, contour columns with sand and clay, not modified clay, and we compared that with sand and our organic clay, and we tried to see what's going on. Uh, but then again, since the concentrations were not exactly the same, uh, then we normalized the concentration to the initial concentration. And what we got is the following. Uh, the clay alone, when mixed with sand, do not absorb. And uh, that means that uh, the BPA goes out from the column right away. After one or two pore volumes, you get the full concentration of the BPA. Um, on the other hand, when we prepared our uh, organo clay sand column, then we got a, a quite nice removal for about uh, 14 per volumes. I, I must remind you that it's quite a high concentration of BPA. That means, uh, uh, again, we need to test that, but uh, 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 by reducing the concentration of BPA, uh, we assume that we will be able to get a lot more per volumes of clean uh, uh, water. Uh, that means that for BPA, uh, Organoclay based on monborilonite and tiamine works relatively nicely. Let's see what's going on with VPS. The results are completely different. At the beginning, the clay itself has a kind of interaction with the VPS. And then what we see is not a, a, a sharp a, a, a kind of breakthrough a, 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 a figure, a, but something that is increasing a relatively slowly. Uh, but uh, it's increasing all the time. And in the end, the BPS is going out. But um, the more disappointing results are when we tested our modified columns. Because what we see is that indeed, we get only about three or four uh, clean uh, uh, pore volumes. After that, the uh, concentration of BPS start getting out from the column. And uh, by the way, those results are very interesting because they are very similar to what uh, Bill uh, 20 years ago uh, had shown about the removal of humic acid by uh, ODTMA organoclase. Uh, that means that we get something that it's a behavior like you get it in, in quaternary ammonium uh, organoclase. Um, but of course, that. Uh, uh, our uh, conclusion uh, from uh, this, those experiments are that uh, BPA and BPS uh, can be absorbed to uh, tiamine uh, montemorillonite, but uh, uh, the absorption is less effective than in phenol. And as a matter of fact, when we are talking about uh, something that might be used uh, uh, outside in uh, pilot experiments or uh, larger experiments, 
uh, we think that BPS, uh, B1 mutualinonide uh, uh, should not be considered as a good absorbent for BPS, uh, but can be considered as a, a effective absorbent for BPA. We assume that the difference uh, uh, of all the results that we saw until now lies mostly on the difference in solubility. Uh, BPS uh, uh, solubility is four folds that of BPA, and due to that, uh, it, it does not prefer so much our hydrophobic uh, platform uh, uh, because it's soluble. Uh, BPA, it's not, uh, it's uh, less soluble, so it escapes, let's say, from the water to a more hydrophobic uh, 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 surrounding like the uh, B1 mutualinonite organoclase. And those differences also influence the batch experiments and the breakthrough columns. Let's talk uh, about the second approach, advanced oxidation process, AOPs. Uh, a short reminding, even though I assume that uh, all of the uh, audience know what, are we, what we are talking about. We are talking about a set of processes that in the end, uh, deliver a, a, a kind of components that attack the pollutant in case, in this case, uh, uh, our EDCs, and uh, make from them uh, something that is biodegradable. Uh, in general, um, we are talking about uh, processes that are might be cheap to install, but uh, involve uh, operating costs like the addition of uh, uh, hydrogen peroxide or ozone or the use of uh, UV uh, uh, lamps, etc. Um, and uh, as a matter of fact, uh, in some cases, the combinations of uh, uh, several AOP approaches together can be very efficient uh, uh, to the removal of pollutants. And that's what uh, we will show in a few seconds. Uh, we combined uh, heterogeneous photocatalysis with hydrogen peroxide together. Um, in general, then again, if we are talking about AOP mechanisms, we are the, speaking about a kind of processes that a, a, make in the end a, a what is called oxidative agents that attack the a compound that we want to degrade. And in the end, we get what we call full mineralization, whether a, a CO2 a, and inorganic salts. That's, the, the, let's say, a, what, what it's our, a, 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 our target. A, not always can be a, a achieved. If I'm using a kind of a, a, a cartoon that was prepared by a, a, a Theodor Stern. A, 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 we were both students of the late a, Professor Leon Margolis. A, if we are talking about a donor and an acceptor in heterogeneous photocatalysis, then a, in general, a, a, what is happening if you don't have a, a, a um, um, a kind of uh, photocatalysis is that the pollutant uh, uh, um, uh, uh, is not degraded. Uh, if we add something that gets the energy from the light and passes it out to the uh, um, pollutant, then we can get that the pollutant is degraded and fades, and, uh, and we would like to have full mineralization uh, and the photocatalyst is now uh, free to go back to a new cycle. Uh, that's the general idea of heterogeneous photocatalyst. Um, and we have a lot of uh, slides that try to explain more or less what is going on. Uh, but then again, there are a few works where they say that uh, most of those uh, slides are indeed uh, kind of assumptions uh, uh, we get oxidative species like the electrons and the holes and the uh, um, uh, hydroxyl uh, radical, uh, etc. And all of them are supposed to attack the pollutant and uh, make a transformation and uh, try to degrade it. 
We focus on a combination of UV uh, heterogeneous photocatalysis and uh, uh, hydrogen peroxide. And we try to see if we can use clays for that purpose and if, uh, um, if they can do something better than uh, the usually widely used photocatalysis. And uh, it's quite difficult because usually the, let's say the gold standard photocatalysis is uh, called the P25 and it has a lot of names because now the patent was over. So it's Ombicat and it's a, a nano a titanium and a, a lot of combinations of uh, three phases of titanium dioxide uh, uh, together that are very, very, very effective as heterogeneous photocatalysis for a lot of materials. Uh, so we wanted to see if we can get something similar to what uh, to the uh, efficiency of P25 uh, uh, by using clays or modified. And uh, what we try to do is to test a, a clay a clay as it is. In this case, we use synthetic monomorylonite. And the reason to use synthetic materials is that uh, those are more pure. So you don't have something that can be considered as a doping material that may influence what's going on. Uh, so we use synthetic monomorylonite and then we prepare the synthetic monomorylonite uh, impregnated with the titanium dioxide by a procedure that we uh, uh, took from the literature. And uh, we did it uh, at uh, two different uh, heterogeneous catalyst concentrations. And uh, we also try to see what's going on when we are adding very low concentrations of hydrogen peroxide. We're talking about less than 60 micromolars of hydrogen peroxide. Uh, we won't didn't want to add too much because if we add too much, then after that, you need to deal with the removal of it. Uh, uh, and that was not the idea. Um, first, uh, I want to show you that we indeed were able to modify the barazin, the, the synthetic monoclonide. Uh, in order to that, I'm showing now uh, XRF uh, measurements of the barazin and of the modified barazin. This is barazim. You can see the peaks uh, that are coming uh, from the uh, uh, aluminum and the silicon and magnesium. And uh, those are lamps, that, uh, lamp emissions, so you should not consider them. And when we impregnate it with the titanium dioxide, then we get very large peaks of titanium. Uh, that measurement was made in order to be sure that we indeed were able to combine the titanium with the mineral. Uh, and then we started uh, doing uh, degradation kinetics uh, uh, by using a photoreactor, a small photoreactor uh, uh, with UVC lamps. Uh, when in general, we're talking about uh, trying to measure the rate, but the problem when you speak about the rate is that uh, uh, um, uh, if you are looking for a reaction, for a degradation reaction, then uh, it fits, the rate fits a kind of a, a concentration to a certain power, what is called an order. Uh, and the order can change depending on the process, but it is usually uh, measured empirically. In most experiments that we saw on the degradation of pollutant by AOPs, there is a, a priori assumption that the process is first order, in some cases, uh, uh, the assumption is the second order. There are also some models that are used that we also used them in the past of pseudo first order, like uh, sec uh, pseudo second order, etc. We tried it to avoid to use such kind of assumptions a priori. And what we tried to, to do is to measure what's going on and try to adapt the best a, a available order and a, a kinetic coefficient uh, by doing, a, let's say, car fitting using solver in this case, solver by Excel. Um, but then you get a kind of a, a problem because you cannot compare kinetic coefficients of processes that are not the same order. Even the units are different. So what we did is to 
all, the, all along speak about the relative concentration. That means the concentration uh, at a certain time divided by the initial concentration. And by doing that, then we get that the, uh, everything is dimensionless, and that allows us to compare uh, the binding coefficient, but more the kinetic coefficient, but more than that, that allows us to compare uh, the half lifetime. And that what is what I'm going to show, the comparisons between half-lifetime on the different processes. Uh, so if we're talking in general about this general pro, uh, uh, order, and if we make a mathematical integration, as long as the order is not one, then we get this equation. And uh, this equation, uh, as a matter of fact, you have two uh, uh, parameters to fit. You have uh, the uh, kinetic coefficient, and you have the order, and then you can uh, try to uh, adapt to, to fit the results to an equation that includes, uh, uh, that behaves like what is written here. And we, you can evaluate the half-life. And this is a very nice parameter because then you can compare this process has a half-life of uh, 20 minutes, this one a half-life of six minutes. Uh, uh, that means that what we did, as a matter of fact, is to compare half lifetimes of the different processes. Uh, I will not go through the uh, different uh, um, um, equations. Uh, first of all, it's different because you cannot integrate uh, the equation as before. Uh, but what I want to show, did if I'm going trying to run through it, sorry. This is a summary of uh, the common processes taken uh, from Wikipedia. As a matter of fact, has a very nice uh, 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 summary of the different equation. Uh, but then we have a very interesting question: which process will be better for the removal of pollutants? And this is a very interesting question because it's not obvious. Uh, the um, let's perform a virtual experiment where we are, we have a, let's say a pollutant that we can adapt to it several uh, AOP processes uh, of uh, zero order, first order, half order, second order, etc. And in all processes, when we start with a concentration of a hundred micromolars, all catalysts, all processes yield a half-life of a uh, half an hour. Uh, that's what we see here. Uh, several processes, in all of them, the half-life is half an hour. What will happen if the concentration is higher or lower of 100 micromolars? Um, if we increase the concentration to 1,000 micromolars tenfold, then we will see that the degradation for the second order process is a lot more effective. On the other hand, the zero order process is almost completely ineffective. But when we are talking about the uh, priority pollutants or about emerging contaminants or about pharmaceuticals or about VPA and VPS, the concentration is usually very, very low. And if we lower the concentration in this case to 10 micromolars, then the second order process is almost completely ineffective. On the other hand, the zero order process will be wonderful. That means that when we are talking about low concentration pollutants, we would prefer low orders, not high orders. On the other hand, when we are talking about efferents that are coming from the industry and the concentration is very high, we will prefer high orders. Uh, and this is very interesting because when we try to see what is happening in uh, AOPs, the assumption that it is always first order, uh, and then since it's first order, it's not influenced by the concentration, it's not um, always a, a real assumption. Um, let's see what uh, we are uh, doing in our experiments we are uh, we have a kind of small spectrophotometer uh, that is connected with a fiber optic uh, to a, um, a fiber optic probe kind of deep probe to that and this is introduced into the vessel where the degradation process is happening you can see here the kibet this is the kibet the the the, the space between the mirror and the probe 
and it goes back to uh, the spectrophotometer from the lamp. And from here, of course, in the end, it goes to the computer and the computer, we monitor and record everything that's happening uh, every 10 or 15 or 20 seconds. Uh, so we get in the end a lot of points uh, for each experiment. And uh, this uh, large amount of data allows us to uh, evaluate what's going on uh, 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 by kind of uh, what's called bootstrap. Uh, that means extracting each time uh, randomly uh, uh, 20 uh, points and uh, making in the end uh, a kind of calculation uh, uh, that uh, um, gives us um, uh, the half-life time. Of course, at the beginning, we needed to be sure that indeed measuring by UV visible gives the real results. In order to do that, we performed an experiment where we compared UV visible measurements with LCMSMS measurements that uh, gives us also intermediate products. And what we saw was uh, uh, that uh, the following. Uh, for VPS, the LCMS and the UV visible give more or less the same results. For VPA, it's something completely different. This is the LCMS results, and this is the UV visible results. And we assume that the reason is uh, that uh, in VPA, we have a, a byproducts that uh, uh, do not disappear very fast. And we are erroneously measuring, measuring, in, measuring them by UV visible as VPA. Uh, so the conclusion from that is that if we want indeed to test our uh, uh, clay minerals and modified clay minerals for heterogeneous catalysis, with UV visible measurements, we need to focus on VPS. Uh, so we continued our experiments. Uh, uh, I, I will continue showing only VPS. We have results for VPA also, but of course those were measured uh, uh, by other techniques. Uh, so we did a lot of experiments at the beginning for the degradation. Uh, 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 we uh, tried to see what's going on with the gold standard P25, titanium dioxide, and we use uh, our uh, uh, synthetic clay and our modified clay. Uh, at the beginning, we used 20 milligrams per liter, and after that, we lowered the uh, concentration of the uh, um, catalyst by two orders of magnitude. Very low uh, uh, concentration of catalyst, 0 0.2 milligrams per liter, and the calculation procedure was uh, based on what's called a bootstrap. Uh, we extracted from uh, a lot of points uh, a random uh, um, sets of uh, 20 uh, points uh, each. And then after that, we adapted our uh, equation to by finding uh, the most, most suitable uh, uh, kinetic coefficient and order. And uh, we made the um, averages and standard deviations of the calculations that were performed on the experiment. Um, let's see what are the, uh, uh, the results. And uh, we will see the dots, uh, the measured dots, and also the lines that were calculated. Uh, this is the uh, degradation by light, without nothing, only light, UV light, UVC light. Uh, we can see uh, uh, that the photolysis uh, works quite nicely and the uh, half-life time is about 22 minutes. Uh, the order is more or less one. When we used uh, hydrogen peroxide, then we lower the half-life time to half of it and the order goes down to 0 0.8. Um, P25 works even better, seven minutes, uh, uh, and the order goes to 0 0.75. Uh, barazim and titanium barazim are very similar in the half lifetime, about 40 minutes. They differ in the order. The titanium barazim has a lower order, but we can see here the results, the triangles and the, uh, and the light blue uh, uh, squares uh, look more or less the same. When we combined uh, our clay and modified clay with hydrogen peroxide, we get a very nice improval, uh, but still, P25 works better. Uh, we get results that are uh, more effective than the hydrogen peroxide alone. Uh, uh, but then again, um, okay, in the, if this is the case, then 
uh, we would prefer, uh, I assume, uh, P25. Uh, so what we did after that is to see what's going on when we lower the concentration of catalyst, because you need to remember that the catalyst itself disperses the light. So we get less light that uh, 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 is coming <coughs> into the pollutant uh, 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 and the effect, um, this effect can be in some cases, as we will see, very interesting. Uh, so we lowered the catalyst concentration and we used uh, 60 micromolars of uh, uh, hydrogen peroxide in some cases and in some cases we didn't. Uh, of course, the photolysis in the hydrogen peroxide gave the same results, but when we lowered the titanium dioxide, we get that the titanium dioxide at lower concentration works, but uh, not so well as at the larger concentration. On the other hand, the barazine uh, 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 and mostly the titanium barazine uh, works a lot better. As a matter of fact, you can see that here at this concentration, the titanium barazine and the P25 are more or less the same. If we add in addition to that hydrogen uh, peroxide, then we get that we are going down to less than seven minutes. And what is not less important, the order goes down to 0 0.5. And if you recall, uh, we are trying to get uh, lower orders. That means that as a matter of fact, we, we can get uh, results that uh, uh, are not so far, and in some cases even better than titanium dioxide by using clays uh, uh, or modified clays, as long as we combine them uh, with hydrogen peroxide. Um, of course, there's a lot of studies that need to be done and the differences between the pollutants are so strong that, the, uh, for example, we are now working uh, with uh, uh, an, anti an antibiotic and uh, titanium uh, or uh, barazim or, or, or modified barazim uh, almost do not do any work. Uh, on the other hand, titanium dioxide works quite nicely. Uh, so uh, everything is very, very specific. Uh, and uh, BPA and BPS uh, uh, can be removed by absorption, mostly BPA. Uh, BPS, uh, we did not test BPA, but BPS can be also uh, uh, removed by uh, photocatalysis. And in this case, uh, clays can be useful in order to prepare efficient catalysts. We are all the time looking for catalysts that work uh, uh, in uh, solar light. Uh, and this, there is a lot of work uh, being done uh, in several uh, uh, research groups ar uh, 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 around the world. Uh, but then again, the, our conclusion from this study, uh, and I think it's very important, the assumption that if something works for pollutant A, it will be wonderful for pollutant B, cannot be made. Uh, you need to uh, test for each pollutant, each process, uh, because uh, uh, it can work for something and for a similar molecule, it can be completely different. Uh, since I want to leave at least five minutes for questions, then I will uh, uh, end by thanking all the students that uh, I collected them together here in a kind of process, uh, 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 in the kind of a lecture that uh, shows the different projects uh, by MSc and BSc students. Thank you very much. Um, yes. I will stop Thank here. You. Thanks, Giorgio. Any uh, questions? We have the three minutes, right? Giorgio will have to leave. Yeah, more or less. Minutes. <laughs> so, I have a question, but uh, maybe if somebody wants to ask, I will just keep my questions on after that. Yes, Michael. So, okay, I will start. Uh, regarding uh, experiment with BPA, BPS, would you consider that? BPS is actually might be ionized. It is a much more acidic as compared with BPA. And at page eight, it definitely uh, significantly ionized, which will just reduce its sorption affinity. And maybe our models should be much more complicated accounting for speciation. Uh, we start our experiments by trying to see uh, if we need to, uh, to adapt the pH uh, when we are quantifying uh, those materials. And uh, as you mentioned, uh, uh, for VPS, we need to make some ad uh, uh, ad adaptation of the pH in the measurement. 
it can be indeed that part of the, um, let's say, less effective uh, absorption is since the conditions of the BPS uh, make some influence on the matrix itself. And uh, by doing that, uh, modifies what's going on in the interaction between uh, B1 and the Montmorillonite. Uh, but then again, the, the bottom line is that uh, for BPA, B1 with Montmorillonite works quite nicely. For BPA, uh, uh, it doesn't. Yeah, that might be just because it is partially nice. But an another question is, uh, it is more general. I mean, methods with the sorption on organic lace, all this photodegradation or oxidation process, you do it mostly, I think, with a single compound, yeah. with single compound. But even okay. if it is a pure water, like a groundwater, it is not single compound, you have a lot of things. But if it's industrial effluent, as you said once, ah, uh, pl plenty of that. Uh, so, <laughs> okay, so which means when you have a, a mixture of compounds, uh, how do you deal with that? You have a competition uh, effect. Uh, you are completely right. And uh, but then again, if we want to elucidate what's going on with each pollutant, we need to start them with them by one by one. In the end, uh, you are right that uh, uh, we have a soup that contains a lot of contaminants and a lot of materials that are not contaminants. And in the most cases that it was tested, uh, the influence is uh, quite bad. But uh, we have at least one uh, set of experiments that we did with caffeine. And in the case of caffeine, what we saw is that uh, up to about a quite large concentration of uh, salt, uh, chloride salts, sodium chloride, calcium chloride, potassium chloride, uh, there is even an improvement in the photocatalysis. Uh, but then again, uh, this is a uh, salt. Uh, we assume that in this case, the influence might be due to uh, influence on the activity coefficient. Uh, if we have another uh, kind of uh, um, material that is attacked by the catalyst or by the light, then the influence will be considerably different. But uh, then again, if we want to try to uh, see uh, what's going on with, um, with a lot of compounds, we need to start one by one because uh, uh, otherwise, I think it will be very difficult to deduce uh, anything. So, uh, thank you. Thank you, Giora. Uh, I am sorry that I have to leave. <laughs> I need to teach thermodynamics. Uh, Michael knows uh, what's going on with that. Uh, so uh, I thank you very much for your attention and and, and thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye. Thank you, Giora. Bye, Shmurik. Thank you. <laughs> thank you.